mechanism of disease map for SIADH, or Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone Secretion. This is a disease involving the hormone ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone. It's a hormone that removes some of the water from your urine. It's antidiuretic, so it's antidiuresis. And we'll be talking about what happens when you have too much ADH. I'll be going through the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of SIADH. And as in all of these flowcharts, the core concepts are color-coded according to this legend up here. So let's clear the board and go through everything one by one. We'll start with the etiology. The etiology of SIADH falls into two big buckets. The extra ADH, the extra antidiuretic hormone, can be produced in the pituitary gland, where it's normally produced, or it can be produced from ectopic or perineoplastic sources. So we've kind of grouped them together in that regard. There are a number of medications that increase pituitary ADH production. First, there are anticonvulsants. This includes carbamazepine and valproate. Some antidepressants can do it, multiple classes of antidepressants. SSRIs, such as sertraline, MAO inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, like amitriptyline, can do it as well. A number of anti-cancer drugs, antineoplastics, can do it as well. This includes vincristine, which is a mitotic inhibitor, and cyclophosphamide and cisplatin, which are alkylating agents. Some illicit drugs, like MDMA, can cause SIADH. Some antipsychotics, like haloperidol, and some analgesics or pain medicines like NSAIDs and opioids. Infections have also been known to increase pituitary ADH production in some cases, specifically pneumonias and HIV infection. COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease has also been associated with SIADH. And there's a few CNS or uh, central nervous system trauma and inflammatory etiologies that have been associated with SIADH. This includes strokes, hemorrhage, trauma, and some iatrogenic causes, like when you poke at the pituitary gland during neurosurgery. So when you're, um, when you're doing a transphenoidal approach to, uh, to, to manipulating this, this, the, uh, the pituitary gland, that can sometimes result in SIADH as well. So those are causes of increased pituitary ADH production. These are the ectopic perineoplastic causes, and they're all... Um, etiologies of, uh, of, of cancer, essentially. Small cell lung cancer is the most common and probably the most well-known association with SIADH of the cancers. The others are head and neck cancers and olifactory neuroblastoma. So as I mentioned, all of these increase ADH production, and that starts a signaling cascade in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts of the nephrons in the kidneys. This results in the insertion of additional aquaporin-2 channels in the luminal cell membrane. These aquaporin-2 channels are water channels, uh, water canals, that water flows from the urine into the rest of the body. So it allows water to be drawn out of the urine into the region of the kidney that has a lot of salt solutions, a very hyperosmolar kidney tissue. So you're pulling water from the urine into the rest of the kidney, so from the tubules into the rest of the kidney. This brings up another nephrogenic cause of SIADH. You can have a gain of function mutation in this same vasopressin channel where the uh, channel is constantly activated. And that kind of skips the high ADH part of the pathway, but it can still cause the symptoms that we'll see downstream from here. So that's a vasopressin 2 receptor gene mutation. The result of having a lot of aquaporin 2 channels is that water is drawn out of the kidneys so that the kidneys themselves and the serum and the uh, rest of the body essentially has a very low osmolality. The urine itself ends up with a very high osmolality. So you're concentrating the urine and you're kind of diluting the rest of the body. Um, you'll have water expansion in the rest of the body because you're retaining water from the urine. You can actually probably see this in your urine osmolality, but this isn't a lab test that's typically done to diagnose SIADH in all cases. The majority of the symptoms come from, of course, the effect on the body, the low serum osmolality, and the volume expansion. When you have a pretty significant volume expansion, that can affect your blood pressure, and the body has a number of regulatory feedback mechanisms that kind of kick in to try to correct this transient water expansion. So you'll have a decrease in aldosterone, an increase in ANP, and an increase in BNP. And this makes sense. We'll take aldosterone as an example. 
in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. The intent is to increase aldosterone to reabsorb all of the sodium from your urine and water follows the sodium and that increases your blood pressure. So it makes sense that when you have volume expansion, your blood pressure is already kind of high, you already have too much volume in your blood, your body's response is going to be to decrease the aldosterone, to decrease the RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system as a response to try to correct that volume expansion. So when you decrease aldosterone, you'll have increased urinary sodium and water follows sodium into the urine. So you'll end up peeing a little bit more. The result of all this is a euvolemic hyponatremia. You end up dumping a bunch of your salts because of this regulatory feedback mechanism. And the only reason that you're doing this feedback mechanism is because you've retained so much water to begin with. So the body's pretty good at regulating its volume levels. You end up euvolemic, but you also end up hyponatremic because your body's method of regulating its volume levels required dumping the sodium, required increasing urinary sodium. The fact that this is euvolemic is significant. It means that you won't have edema in the patient. So if a patient presents with hyponatremia and leg swelling or hyponatremia and water in the lungs, you'll have to look for another source of, uh, of that hyponatremia. Maybe heart failure is something that, that should be considered. In addition, all of this feedback, as I mentioned, usually results in the patient being normotensive. So somebody presenting with SIADH will have no edema, they'll have normal blood pressure, they'll have a euvolemic hyponatremia. So that's really what you'll see on your, um, on your complete metabolic panel. And a lot of the manifestations come from this euvolemic hyponatremia. So the patient, when they have mild hyponatremia, they can have anorexia, they can have nausea, vomiting, they can have headaches and muscle cramps. This is of course an electrolyte disturbance, so a lot of things can come from it. In more severe hyponatremia, so moderate hyponatremia now, the patient can have lethargy, muscle weakness, and confusion. And in the more serious cases, when you have really bad hyponatremia down to below 120 millo equivalents, you'll have osmotic fluid shifts. So this can result in cerebral edema, uh, brain swelling, and increased intracranial pressure. This can exacerbate the confusion, and it can also lead to altered mental status, altered consciousness, and seizures. And again, this is the severe hyponatremia case where you're uh, at a sodium level of less than 120. So this has been a mechanism of disease flowchart for SIADH. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.